From the Auto Line Studios, here is your host, John McElroy. Thanks for tuning in to today's show. The discussion is going to be all about manufacturing, advances, technological advances, and trends that we see coming. And I've got three experts to talk about it, including Michael Robinet, the Managing Director of IHS Automotive, Jay Barron, the CEO for the Center of Automotive Research in Ann Arbor, and Lori Harbor, the President of Harbor Results. Great having you all here. Thanks, John. We keep hearing in the United States that manufacturing is making a comeback. And I want to get your opinion on that. Jay, why don't I start with you? Is manufacturing truly making a comeback? Here? Uh, it certainly is, as, especially in auto. Uh, we're producing a lot of cars now, uh, and a lot of them here in the upper Midwest. We've had the expansion in the southeastern region as well. Uh, but this is a great uh, place to produce vehicles. We have the established supply chains, uh, and we have some uh, state-of-the-art factories. So this, is, uh, this part of the industry is doing very well. You see it that way, Michael? I would agree. There's, there's no, way that, no way that we could gain this much volume that quickly without truly a manufacturing renaissance, especially after the automotive recession of 2009 and into 2010. The only way that we've been able to come back is really mastering the manufacturing, becoming more flexible, and really being able to do more with less. Lori, you really pay attention to what's going on in the supplier industry. Do you see it on that side of the business as well? Absolutely. And the suppliers are working really hard to get as much product out as they can. And it's kind of exciting to see them looking at, you know, throughput and, and lean manufacturing techniques to try to get more capacity because nobody really wants to make huge investment in capital. So how can we do it, like Michael said, by doing, you know, more with the same and, and, and be able to do it more efficiently? We, of course, have seen a, a collapse in the automotive business in the 2008-2009 time frame. It's been climbing back since then. So, of course, we've seen an increase. But are we seeing more manufacturing coming back on shore? <clears throat> I think you are seeing pieces of it come back on shore. Uh, you know, prior to manufacturing, you have to have uh, technology development. You've got to have a supply chain. You look at the resources in Michigan in particular uh, around technical development of the auto industry. Uh, there is no place in the world, perhaps, with this kind of a density of technology development, and you need that. Then you get into some of the areas that Laurie's involved with, with the tooling industry. A lot of it's right here. So this, these are the seeds to manufacturing, and we have all of the, uh, the foundation to, to, to really support that. I think there's no doubt that, that we've been able to gain this quickly because of some of the extra flexibility that's been added to, uh, to the, to the uh, framework and as well as supply base. So for instance, the vehicle manufacturers, they have fewer platforms, which means that they're probably more flexible with fewer build processes. So they can literally jam more vehicles into a facility, whereas before you'd have a lot of sort of pigeonholed facilities. I can only make one vehicle. And if that vehicle doesn't sell, then I gotta lay my people off. Those days are, for the most part, behind us. So we're seeing plants build multiple models, not just one. There's model. no doubt. I, I remember we, we did some work many, many years ago. Before the auto pact uh, in, in Windsor, there were plants that were making nine different vehicles because, because of tariffs, you couldn't get them over the border. Mm -hmm. We're almost back in some respects to that level, but in a much more flexible fashion because we're off of uh, fewer build processes and fewer platforms. Do you see onshoring on the, the part of the suppliers as well? Definitely, especially as Jay said on the tooling side. We're seeing a lot more tools that used to be made in China, partially because labor rates are rising, all costs are rising overseas for China. So that's one of the reasons. But the other thing, is, as Mike talked about, is with that complexity at the, at the plant level and just within mass customization of the vehicle for this younger generation, we're seeing 20, 30 percent more tools per vehicle than we used to see. Frankly, lead times are so tight, I can't get it off the boat fast enough, right? So as everybody works to do so many vehicles in such a short period of time, it's making that option less and less viable. And so we're seeing more manufacturing here for, in those areas of the business. You know, the other piece of that, John, is, um, and I've always said, complexity is good for our industry. Uh, complexity is not good for the low-cost countries. The engineering base here in Michigan is second to none in the world. We have excellent engineering. Uh, if you keep making cars complicated, the engineering really has to be done where the heart of the industry is. Right. So um, we do more of engineering. We, we maybe outsource some of the labor-intensive aspects of tooling or manufacturing. Uh, but when it comes to uh, engineering the vehicle, uh, you know, we have lots of new materials. We have new joining. We have, there's so much complexity going on in the industry right now. We have the uh, fuel economy to thank for some of that. Uh, and so much uncertainty so that we have uh, uh, lower volumes and bigger model mix and so on. Uh, that really calls for a lot of technology to, to roll this out. And I think, frankly, I think that's good for where you have these intellectual centers like we have here in Michigan. 
we see uh, the shale revolution having produced all this natural gas and propane that can be used and it's driven down energy costs. Is, is that playing a role in automotive is, at all in terms of onshoring manufacturing? Um, I, I think that might play some role, but, but we get a, a work back a little bit. It comes down to basic economics. I think what you, you've seen a lot of vehicles that used to be imported from Japan or Korea or Germany now being built here. Or and Mexico. It, or Mexico. Right. Um, and, and it's not because these companies are benevolent and saying, oh, I got pressure from Washington mm -hmm. or from Mexico City and need to move the production. That's not the case at all. It's all about currency. And also, uh, Lori mentioned earlier, logistics. So currency, if I know it's going to cost me the same amount of money uh, for the next five years to build, let's say, a Toyota Camry or some other vehicle, that's much better than importing it. And therefore, my costs are going up and down with the currency. And therefore, and logistics as well. Uh, logistics costs are going up very, very quickly, especially deep sea logistics. And so when you're sort of at the mercy of that, you want a more stable cost base, and that's exactly what, why we've seen uh, this renaissance of more capacity moving here. You, you do have to acknowledge the energy cost, and, but the energy costs in Mexico are not lower than ours. They're, they're relatively high. Yeah. Uh, so the growth of production in Mexico, which is really uh, going at a phenomenal pace, uh, to some extent maybe at the expense of the United States, um, it's really driven by other factors than energy, because uh, it, energy could play a role. It's probably it's connected more political to uh, free trade agreements and other, and other factors like that. Mm -hmm. What about uh, the role of unions in all this, uh, specifically the, the UAW? We've seen them uh, prevented from striking because of uh, the bailout agreement. Uh, as part of uh, the whole bailout process, too, the union had to agree to uh, a lot more flexibility. Some of it they were doing on their own with the companies and negotiating before the bailout. But, w Michael, what's your, your view? Is, is the UAW holding back? the Detroit automakers as they try to compete? I would say a decade ago, yes. Right now, probably not. Um, in fact, it's funny, uh, you've seen UAW facilities really open the doors to say, listen, we would like a third crew or a third ship, knowing that if they didn't do that, they would give the OEM an excuse to go down to Mexico and open up a new mm -hmm. plant. So I, I, they would much rather have a stronger membership, uh, more fully employed uh, mem membership. That's, that's definitely in their wheelhouse. They do not want to give the OEMs a reason to ship production somewhere else. There's definitely a lot of efficiencies that they made, like you said, 10, 12 years ago. I mean, there's plants of the OEMs that are as productive or, or even more so than a Toyota facility or a Nissan facility. So there was a lot of progression that was made there and, and a lot of movement to, to really be part of the process and, and not be part of the ones that are left behind. Of course, we see the foreign automakers operating in the U.S. pretty much doing everything in their power to keep the union out. So if if Big three or Detroit three plants can be so efficient, then, then why not let the union in? Oh, it's kind of the devil you know versus the devil you don't. The, the, <laughs> let's face it, the, the D3, the Detroit three, have been working with unions, what, since the 40s or so. So, um, And these other companies, they don't have them uh, to, to bring them into the equation. It's just something that they don't know what, what, what complexity that's going to add to, the, to making decisions and how quickly they can move. So I, it's understandable why there's some resistance, at least by most of the OEMs anyways. And they're as competitive as, as the big three plants. I mean, they're paying at the same scale. The issue's the retirement fund. I mean, that's where the big issue was years ago when they did the negotiations. So they're as competitive when it comes to pay. And frankly, a lot of people say, they listen to me, I'm empowered, I don't need, I don't need a union. Yeah. Let's talk about uh, some of the materials that uh, the auto industry is turning to now. Jay, you mentioned that earlier, the corporate average fuel economy regulations really start to ramp up next year through 2020 to even 25. Five, five percent a year. And uh, it's not just the fuel economy, it's also the emissions, uh, which, are, which are ramping down uh, from regulations from the EPA. So it's, it's NHTSA and CAFE and it's EPA and, and emissions. And, um, <clears throat> you know, there's several technologies you can do to, to address these issues. Obviously powertrain, one of them, and electrification and hybrids. Uh, but one of the major technologies clearly is lightweighting, which is bringing new materials into the, fa into the factory. Uh, with respect to the powertrain, you can go to various types of hybrids and electrification, uh, but the current gasoline engine can only go so far, and it's kind of the benefits of tapering off. So I, I really think there's an awful lot of uh, attention being aimed at light weighting. Uh, the Ford F-150, of course, has been the big earth shaker at the auto show, 
just going from steel to aluminum body changes a lot of things in the factory. Uh, and then most companies see us going to it from aluminum to other mixed materials with more magnesium, more titanium, and lots of composites and such. Well, this is changes the way you form these parts, the way you uh, join these parts, the way you paint these parts. It really changes the whole supply chain and the way you design these parts. So uh, a lot going on uh, trying to address, uh, address this. And I, you know, we have a couple of um, factories. Uh, Sterling Heights is an example at Chrysler. Uh, which is a state-of-the-art factory, and, and of course Ford's going through this conversion now as they get to uh, the aluminum truck. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, lot going on, and there's a lot of complexity uh, that's, that's going to play out. I think um, what, what Jay mentioned earlier in terms of the fuel economy, it, it's it, this whole lightweighting movement is going to be the gift that keeps on giving for at least the next decade, at least the next decade. Because as was mentioned, you know, we, we've really kind of, I wouldn't say we've, quite, we've hit the crescendo, but we've done a lot on the powertrain side. The real movement in terms of improving fuel economy and lowering emissions is going to have to come through lightweighting. Um, and, and everybody's going to have to understand that. And we've talked to a, a various OEMs, and, and they're actually very concerned. They know what's going to happen for the next cycle, so the next five, six years. They have no idea what's going to happen after that. So the whole idea of a build process, I build my vehicle in a certain way, is going to change when I start to add new materials and I start to employ more aluminum and more magnesium and um, carbon fiber, it just changes complexity tremendously. So there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of risk in what's happening in the industry over the next 10 years. Lori, hey, usually, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, and the push down of the supply base is, is significant because they're dealing with it at a very high degree of complexity. So, you know, some of the OEMs today have 50, 60% of their volume on vehicles that range between 70 and 100,000 in total annual volume. So the complexity in those plants just multiplies itself down at the supplier. So when you deal with multiple materials, multiple processes for manufacturing, they're all trying to figure out how we do it, which back to Jay's point about China, is there's a real challenge for them to process that kind of complexity. They're, it's a very foreign thing to them, and they struggle to problem solve. Like, our teams tend to be able to get in and solve problems pretty quickly. So, <clears throat> The auto industry, despite all these recalls that we read about, really has a pretty good track record when it comes to quality. But, you know, what I know about manufacturing is as you introduce change, you introduce variability, and variability is bad for quality. Mm -hmm. Will the move to these materials affect the, the quality, the, the durability of these vehicles? Well, there's definitely a lot of work at those both, particularly the supplier level, since they're providing a lot of parts that then potentially could end up in some of these recall situations, where they're doing R&D to, to, again, figure out how to process them, avoid damages. The aluminum thing is a huge deal because it's a very different material to deal with. You know, a, a worker puts a, has a belt on and he ruins that piece of material or that tool that's made out of aluminum. So there's a whole set of different training and education that has to go on at the employee level, which makes hiring and finding the right people very challenging because you need a different level of skill than we might have needed 20 years ago. Jay, what's your thought on that? Because I, I'm sure good cars will still get shipped to dealers. But as you know, that might involve a whole lot of repair and replacement right. in right. the plant. Right. So d will not introducing all these new materials impact quality? <clears throat> um, there's the potential to impact quality. Uh, the auto companies will not uh, ship unsafe cars that are unsafe crashworthy wise. They will not do that. They will, they will uh, manage that process. <clears throat> um, I think what this really does is uh, it opens up the door, as, as Laurie's pointing out. A lot of this technology is going to come in from the supply base. Mm -hmm. The aluminum companies, and it's not just aluminum, it's composites companies. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of composite companies out there ready to sell their resins and polymers and such. Uh, and along with that comes the joining technologies, the adhesives, the coatings. There's a lot of technology, and the uh, auto companies are very lean these days. They need help. Uh, so one of the things that this fuel economy drive has done is it's opened the door to bringing in the technology providers from the supply base. So, you know, uh, Michael referred to this as the gift that keeps on giving. We refer to it as free beer. Everybody wins. Lighter cars drive better. You get better fuel economy. Uh, it's a, it's a uh, great opportunity for the suppliers to get engaged and share their technology. Uh, there may be some bumps in the road. Uh, we like to introduce technology incrementally. Small uh, Engineers tend to be conservative and want to go one step at a time. This is why the F-150 was so dramatic, uh, because it was a whole body uh, and a high volume uh, uh, facility going to aluminum. We normally would like to go uh, aluminum hoods, aluminum deck lid, maybe aluminum doors, and, but this takes 25 years. 
Uh, so uh, Ford did it all in one big step. So it'll be interesting to watch that rollout. They have a lot to learn about processing a huge uh, and high volume aluminum facility, but uh, they will work those, th th those details out. You know, you mentioned quality, and, and, and let's face it, if you aren't building a high quality vehicle in this market, you probably not, are not in this market. So quality is, is, is now changed to more of a perception. Uh, is it content? Is it, is it styling? Is it what's the brand image? Um, uh, what's my service at the dealer? How am, I, how am I treated? Quality has now become something completely different. And as was mentioned earlier, you know, the suppliers are going to drive a lot of that new technology. You know, we've talked often that the suppliers don't, you know, don't alienate your supply because now they have many other choices. They can go see your customer down the road and give them the technology instead. So it, the, the playing field's evening out quite a bit, and it's actually really interesting to see how it all works out. Jay, you mentioned all this processing and manufacturing technology that's going on. I want to ask you about 3D printing. Mm. Some <laughs> call it uh, additive manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, there, there's a big buzz around it, but it's Bring us up to date with your knowledge of what the auto industry is doing with this. First of all, it's a wonderful technology. It, frankly, it's not really brand new. It's been around for a while. Uh, they've made them some advancements to this. Uh, I've seen it used for tooling, for low volume tooling. You can't make a high volume tooling because the dur durability of the materials uh, comes into question. But in terms of its flexibility uh, and ability to make tools or refine tools or repair tools, it's a fantastic technology. Um, it can also make conformal molds where you can have built-in cooling channels and things that you can't do with a material, with a process where you whittle away material. So um, it's got some unique capabilities. I, uh, it's always been well known for a prototype kind of a process because it's slow. It's slow and it tends to work within a small window. Uh, I don't think we're going to see any big dramatic implementation of this technology in high, any high volume production process anytime soon. Uh, it's good for prototype, maybe for low volume. It's good for flexibility if you can make what, a variety of different parts and so on. Um, so yeah, it will continue to grow in the industry, but uh, I don't think it's going to be as uh, earth-shaking as some of the other technologies that are coming in around these new materials. Other thoughts on, on uh, 3D? 3D, <coughs> possibly, I, I guess my uh, understanding of that is not quite as good as it should be, but I'm going to tell you the truth. I think in terms of some of this material substitution, as a derivative, it's, it's how quickly we can get carbon fiber cycle time down. I think that that's going to be a big driver for the next cycle in terms. And so 3D may not have a, a part in that, but I think that carbon fiber is going to make a, it's going to have a big deal. And of course, BMW has made a huge commitment right. to carbon fiber with its i3 electric car and its i8 hybrid. And uh, Boy, talk about a big learning curve. There's a huge one there in making a full body out of carbon fiber. And they're all in. They are all in. Mm -hmm. John, we have, we have uh, BMW at management briefing seminars this, this year with the i3 that we'll be talking about the design of that structure. And there's little doubt that BMW is a world leader on, on carbon fiber, particularly because of that vehicle. Of course, under it is an aluminum substructure, chassis and, and such. Um, <clears throat> we have been using sort of the, uh, the pulse that, you know, carbon fiber is somewhere in the order of $10 a pound, 10, 11 bucks a pound and of course steel's under a buck a pound. So there's a big gap there. Of course you don't replace a pound with a pound, but there's still a big gap there. And a lot of that's processing costs as well as the carbon cost. Um, but the, the rule of thumb has been if we can get the cost down to maybe $5 a pound, it might become viable for higher volume vehicles. But I, I think um, part, of the, part of the BMW philosophy, of course, was they used a very expensive material on a 100% electric vehicle. Uh, the weight reduction value of a, of a BEV is worth a lot more than it is for a conventional car because batteries are very expensive. Uh, so they had certain objectives. Meaning that if you make the car lighter, you don't have to put as many batteries in, and then you take battery cost yeah. out faster than correct. you add That's it true. with the carbon fiber. That is correct. Or actually what they would say is we get more range. We keep all the batteries in, but we just get more range <laughs> is really what they'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> John, I just want to add one thing to the 3D printing. We're actually seeing more of that in the supplier side. Again, partially because of tight lead times. Suppliers are being asked to come up with prototype parts on things that, frankly, tools haven't even been kicked off on yet. So it's very difficult. We're seeing actually more aluminum prototype tools being made where we kind of had seen that go away and now they're coming back a little bit because we just, we're trying to kind of put an elephant through a snake with all these launches in the system that we don't have people and resources to do. So we have a couple customers who are absolutely dedicated to 3D, making tools at higher volumes than what people may think, mm. and are running parts consistently. So the lower these volumes get with the higher degree of complexity, the more that becomes an issue. And, and frankly, it's probably a little higher in other industries than it is automotive. Automotive, in this case, is probably 
not standing in line first to get as much of the technology, but we see a lot in medical and in aerospace. Well, and again, medical and aerospace don't have the, the manufacturing volume right. that automotive right. does. Right. And, but, but going back to what you were just saying, then I got to believe this ties into the, the increased use of 3D printing with suppliers. Does this get back to what you were talking about before? So many more model variations that need so many more tools and Right. Boy, the, the tooling industry has got to love it, but I'm sure they're pulling their hair out at the same time right. trying to get the job done. Well, well, when we did our study last fall, we talked about 20% more tools per vehicle than there was 10 years ago. Now, as we've been presenting to all the OEMs, they're telling us, yeah, and it's going to be another 20% in the next five years. And, and what's driving that? It's, it's all of that mass customization. It's take rates of 1,000 to 5,000 on one piece of technology on a vehicle. So, so the, you know, the days when Honda would spit out the SE and the LE and, the, you know, and, and every one of them had the same features, not so much anymore. And even Honda and Toyota and Nissan saying, we're adding that complexity because we've lost the market share. We didn't have some technology. We didn't have some features. So, and, and the other big push that, that affects North American manufacturing is those companies, because of the complexity, are saying, I don't have four models here anymore, I have 30, and I'm making the vast majority of my tools still in Japan. And because I'm gonna customize more, there's no need to make them in Japan anymore. So we got all this pressure coming to North America for the tooling side of it. And you know these companies are spending two to three billion dollars a year on tooling. If that goes up another 25%, when you add in the complexity of the part, so that tool, although we think tool cost has gone down dramatically, Look at a bumper fascia from 15 years ago and look at it today. There's no way that tool cost went down, right? So that's all driving this, and people are looking at it much differently than they used to. And as you talk about technology, what can we do in the tool to make that part easier to manufacture? How do I get cycle times down? Yeah, How do I process? Cadence is a cadence also in the industry. I mean, we we used to have what six, seven year cadence, maybe with a mid cycle. And explain that a second for people who don't understand. Cadence is, is, is essentially how often you switch your vehicles over a, a major revision of a vehicle, and it, it used to be six, seven years. I can remember Caprices and Impalas that would go for nine or ten mm -hmm. years, um, and then you'd have a mid cycle enhancement or an MCE as they call it. Uh, do front and rear end, maybe maybe the odd door panel or something, or or not, but our but now you've got vehicle manufacturers that are checking all the boxes. I got a problem here. I got a problem here. They're fixing everything three years into the vehicle. So, and that adds to the complexity of tooling because every time there's a new part, there's probably a new tool somewhere along the way. John, the, the other factor uh, driving up cadence, of course, is uh, with this technology, uh, with the push for new technologies to get fuel economy. Uh, you can't, if you have a technology that can improve fuel economy, you can't wait two or three years to yeah. implement it. Yeah. You're going to roll it out now. Yeah. So you're going to see faster cadence on powertrain as well, as well as the body. Uh, because we, and it's, it's all a matter of staying above the re minimum required cafe line. And when you think about, I mean, like your phone, how it changes, you buy one three months later, it's a new one, right? Well, I was in China two weeks ago, and the lighting systems that are going into vehicles today, you know, as soon as Audi puts one in, then Cadillac does it, then somebody has to replace that. And that, it was a huge mid-cycle enhancement change. Tools used to take six, seven tools to make a headlamp assembly, 29 tools on one headlamp assembly that I saw last week. And the light piping complexity of those edges to get that reflection is amazing. So we're not you know, decontenting these vehicles. Literally. We're adding much, much more complexity. And so. <laughs> yeah. Well, the designers love making these kinds of changes. They love bringing that kind of technology in. Jay, we're getting down to the very end. Anything that we haven't covered yet? What, what, what excites you about what you see coming in well, manufacturing? I'll, I'll one thing I like, though, is, uh, like I said, complexity is good for us. We're, uh, we're, this is an engineering manufacturing industry, if there ever was one. We don't want to just be somebody that makes stuff that somebody else tells us how to make it. We want to engineer it, we want to develop it, we want to design it. And we have the supply base around here in the upper Midwest to, to support it. So all this technology, I mean, using headlights for, as a major styling feature is what, what you're describing, uh, is really a big deal. And it, it doesn't affect the tooling, just, just the tooling. It affects a lot of different suppliers. So this is a great opportunity to bring the industry together. We've been talking with the, uh, the state auto executive, Nigel Francis, we're talking to others about, we've got to develop mechanisms that bring the industry together to collaborate, to com communicate, to work more cohesively. It's not a top-down industry anymore. It, it's really a, uh, a, a great big industry that's got to work together in some kind of a fashion bring them, and bring them together. Michael, anything out there real quick? Um, I, I, just love the fact, I just love the fact that we, that 
not all the plants, but uh, seventy percent of the production by the by the end of this year, two thousand and fourteen, is is probably going to be made on a three career three shift basis. That basically means that we've pushed to the very edge. Um, yeah, we can. There's a couple more plants we can sh shift over, but it's 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 incremental. Now we're talking about new brick and mortar, and that's exciting to think about where we were five years ago, that we are now at the prospect, and the, certainly on the supplier side, but definitely on the vehicle manufacturing side, new brick and mortar is coming. And super quick, anything that really excites you out I'm just excited to see my manufacturing clients actually work on the manufacturing stuff they should have been working on 15 years ago, <laughs> trying to get more out of the same. So their challenge is people, skill and manufacturing. That's the challenge. Yeah. Well, this is all good news. Three shift operations, that means a lot of profits, means that we need more jobs. We just got to get the right skills lined right. up to, so people can get those jobs. Right. Michael Robinette, really want to thank you for being here. Jay Barron, uh, you as well. Lori Harbour, great discussion. It's very interesting what's, what's going on in manufacturing. And I, I hope the audience appreciates that how much wealth this drives through society and at many different levels of society too it, yeah. it, it's such a critically important thing you mentioned you know the the tooling then to the suppliers then to the automakers themselves you know then you get to the dealerships and everything like that but it, it really starts with the manufacturing process and I want to thank you all for having come in today and shared your thank thoughts you. with it and i want to thank all of you for having tuned in